Hey everyone, I will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the School Council Summit. We appreciate you coming out tonight. Uh, I know that you came, uh, and we'd like to do this, by the way, once or twice a year. Just try to get together to talk a little bit, just as y'all meet throughout the year on your school councils. Talk a little bit about what's going on in the system. And some overviews of some things that are going on, things that we're looking forward to. And I know that y'all came to hear from Dr. Evan Porter. I promise you it was on its way. You only have to suffer with me probably a few minutes. But uh, just to explain, uh, Dr. Horton apologizes, but he and some others are coming over here. As y'all may know, uh, Mrs. Sue Brown uh, passed away this week. And Mrs. Sue was a longtime uh, teacher here in Coweta County, educator, music educator in Coweta County Schools. And then after she retired, she uh, ran for and served on the Board of Education uh, for the District 2. And she served for about 16 years, uh, retired at the end of 2020. Buzz Glover ran for her seat, serving District 2, and, and has uh, taken that and done a great job. Uh, but Miss Sue has had, uh, been ill for a bit, and she passed away this weekend. Uh, that funeral is at 530 in Coon, so I think it's probably wrapping up, and we'll have a number of folks who will join us. In fact, I'll just mention one other thing about that. Uh, Sue Brown, uh, actually is a fairly good example when you take a look back at her career. Uh, not just the dedication that we get from our teachers and our schools, but also how we change, evolve, and grow over time. I think when she came to Coweta County in the late 1970s, she was one of just a very few music teachers for her elementary schools. She had a circuit of schools that she would go to and teach a full day or half a day in many, many schools over the course of the week. And of course, we you know we're able to grow that program, so we have music programs in our uh, elementary schools, just as we've grown our other fine arts programs uh, in our middle schools and high schools as well. And when she came to the Board of Education, she was a really big champion for fine arts education in Calgary County Schools, a big champion of the Nixon Center. And she's worked with uh, Don Nixon when he was with us, and Kathy Nixon since then, in being a champion for this kind of facility. So, uh, Dr. Horton's going to come in. I'll turn over to him when he gets here, and he'll take some of the bigger things. We'll take just some of the smaller things to give you sort of the beginnings of an overview of what's going on in the school system and where we are in the school system. Every one of you have one of these documents. This is what we'll use for the most part tonight is we talk about uh, test scores and uh, some other major initiatives, including security, construction. Of course, the rebuilding of New High School, things like that. Also, take a look uh, into the future with a little bit of growth data and some other things that we're looking at as a school system. Uh, even though we'll kind of go through from front to back, I'll direct your attention really to the back. Back page, just for a moment, just for a very brief overview of the Calvary County school system. You see our mission, vision, and beliefs. Uh, these are the things that guide what we do in our schools, all 32 of our Calvary County schools also drive our strategic planning uh, and drive what we do every five years for accreditation. We'll talk a little bit about that. You see our finance over to the side, our budget this fiscal year ending uh, June 30th, uh, 23, $243 million for the millage rate uh, that was lowered to 16 bills uh, by the Board of Education this last August. Uh, that's actually the third time it's been reduced over the last several it came down from about 18.59 mills in 2020. You'll see our pupil, per pupil uh, expenditures there uh, for the most recent fiscal year ending, which is last year, ending June 30th, $11,627 uh, uh, from the state's calculation of per pupil expenditures in Calhoun County, compared to a Georgia average of about $12,519, just to give you an idea of where we are. And you also see our class-wide, uh, or system-wide, excuse me, class ratios, just to the right of that, and total student, student enrollment. We'll talk a little bit about growth, but just know that that's kind of where we are, at a bit above 23,000 students. That's the largest we've ever been in the Calhoun County school system. And it also represents an uptick in growth uh, over the last couple of years in particular. And we really, I think we crossed, I'm gonna get this wrong, but I think we crossed 22,000 students somewhere around uh, 2011, 2012, and really sort of hovered there between 22 and 23,000 students. Uh, we've seen growth of around four or 500 students per year in total 
K, pre-K through 12 uh, for these last couple of years, leaving us 23,000. And there you see our 3,187 employees, about 3,200 employees not including substitutes. And the very last thing I'll say is Dr. Horton has walked in. You also see right down there at the bottom our Board of Education. We're all served by a Board of Education of seven members serving four-year terms, two at-large seats, and five uh, district seats. And right down there, you see on that second row behind uh, our chairman, uh, Andrew Copeland, uh, our new uh, vice chairman. He was vice chairman, but uh, our new vice chairman, Buzz Glover, uh, and the other members of the Board of Education along with Superintendent Horton. And so, I've set it up for you, and you can take it from here if you like, unless you'd like me to take the very first one. Man, keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to, I told them I'm going to do the boring bits. I'm going to do the boring bits. This is exciting for us, but it is good stuff. And I'm going to do the little stuff. Let you this is a good job. job. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. We'll go to the very first page just for a couple of things. This very first section. You see there, and I won't spend a great deal of time here, but our Calhoun County on time grad work ticked back up from 89.3% 89, 89 uh, to 90.5%. That's our on-time graduation rate. That's those freshmen who begin in our schools or have transferred in uh, from somewhere but began as freshmen and then four years later graduated from a Galway County School on time uh, at the end of that, that four year, so or either before or, or at that four year period at the very, very end of that. You see that there was a downtick in that statewide and here in Calhoun County, essentially in that year after the pandemic, uh, going from 91.6 down to 89.3, came back up to 90.5. You see our 2022 SAT results, uh, we continue to outperform the state of Georgia and the nation. The main thing that I always try to get people to take away, particularly if you're longtime Georgians, is I always remind everybody that for years, uh, when we would say, well, County County Schools, we outperform the state of Georgia. We do better on average. They'll say, well, that can't be too hard. Well, yes, it is. It has gotten actually very hard. Georgia is one of the higher performing SAT states and has become that over the last several years. So we outscore the nation by quite a bit. We also outscore the state of Georgia and continue to, to do that very consistently over the last few years. And the very last thing, and of course, y'all can ask any questions if we pass, if we go by too quickly on any of this. But I just mentioned down there, 21, 22 Georgia milestones. Of course, we're you know, going to see some of those test results for this year or the next several months or at the end of the next several months. Uh, but what we saw last year in 21, at the, really at the, at the end of 2022, was something that sort of mirrored what we saw with grad rate and some other indicators. We saw a, a dip in performance in Cowley County that rebounded the year later. This doesn't have anything to do with the individual students and the individual student experiences, but overall, we saw a bit of a decrease that wasn't as steep as the decrease that we might see statewide in Georgia. It was not as nearly as steep as some of the decreases in student performance that we saw nationwide, but we did see some of that, and then we've come very close to rebounding. Depends on which indicator you're talking about, very close to rebounding to pretty much where we were as we entered that dip, or right before we entered that dip. Doesn't mean that we're doing everything we want to do right now, but we're doing very well, and we've come back very well. And I, the only other thing I point I'd make is we, we didn't experience, like I said, that that a steep a decline in uh, uh, temporary decline in student performance as you saw in some other places. I think because both statewide and you know, by and large here in Calhoun County, we kept our schools open. Uh, there was there was less time uh, for an awful lot of students that they spent outside of the face-to-face -face classroom and then got back into that face-to-face -face classroom. And the only other thing I'll point out, just right over there, uh, you'll see uh, just a few of our honors, U.S. News and World Report's best high schools very consistently on that list. That should be coming out here for this year, the next uh, month or two. Uh, several other honors in our special education department, our music programs, our, our schools, and our principals uh, and our school leadership. And I'll mention again, just below, uh, right down there, Sue Brown served as board chair just passed away this weekend. I also want to mark that uh, Richard Brooks, longtime superintendent here in Calhoun County Schools, also a big champion of the Center for Forming and Visual Arts, and sort of a visionary and supporter of the Central Education Center. Mark Whitlock, CEO of CEC, right in the back, uh, something that is, has 
a tremendous benefit to our community and really a tremendous benefit to all the state. Replicated 57 times around the state of Georgia. What we did here in Coweta County about 20 years ago, Richard Brooks was an integral part of that and an uh, integral part of putting that community-wide vision together and making that a reality. Also built about half the schools, almost half the schools that are in Coweta County right now, double the size of the school system, so to speak, uh, when he was superintendent, built an awful lot of you know, great facilities around here. Wanted to mention that he passed away at the end of last year. Uh, and with that, we're getting into construction in New York High School. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know me, I'm Evan Horton, uh, I'm superintendent. Let me first off apologize for being a few minutes late. Uh, as, as Dean mentioned, I'm sure he mentioned to you before I got here, uh, one of our long-serving board members passed away over the weekend. Uh, funeral was at 5.30 today, and, uh, you know, I knew, I knew where I needed to be. Um, I needed to be there. Um, she's a big part of, of why I wanted to be superintendent and a big part of, of me actually becoming superintendent. Um, and Miss Sue Brown um, was a, she's a firecracker. She was a dedicated servant uh, to this community, to this school system. And uh, every day I'm reminded of things that Sue Brown uh, did to make this school system a special place. This place you're standing in right now, uh, in large part, was because, quite frankly, Sue Brown demanded it. Um, so when, when the funeral was planned for tonight, it being at 5.30, this is 6.30, uh, we did like we always do, and we just, uh, we kind of made it happen. Um, so Dean, thanks for, thanks for teeing things up for me. Uh, long story short, I know Dean covered a, a good bit of information. Um, we are in a pretty good place. We really are. Um, it is hard to believe, at least it's hard for me to believe, that June 1st, I will be going into year four as superintendent. It has been a whirlwind. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was named on March the 3rd of 2020. And nine days later, the wheels came off. And they stayed off for a while. Uh, we've been through pandemics. We've been through tornadoes, and we are now at a place uh, as a school system where it's time to recalibrate uh, and to reestablish maybe some expectations and standards that we didn't get a chance to, to reestablish whenever I became superintendent. Because quite frankly, all we have done for the better part of the last three years is live in crisis mode. I see some of our principals here. I cannot tell you, I see the blank stairs. It's a product of the last three years. <laughs> These folks have done an amazing job in some of the most very difficult circumstances anybody ever could have envisioned. They did not go into education to deal with the things that we've had to deal with, but they've done so and they've done so gracefully. Um, they've kept students first in everything that they do. And I couldn't be prouder uh, to work alongside them each day. These are some good people. Uh, and they are the foundation of uh, what, what I truly believe is the best school system in the state of Georgia. And we can talk through numbers all night long, graduation rates, milestone scores, SAT scores, all that fun stuff. But I firmly believe, and I tell this to our principals, that we're, we're more than numbers. Numbers are great, numbers are metrics that, that you have to measure by, but we are about empowering kids for success in school and life and doing whatever it takes to ensure that from pre-K through graduation, that we are doing the things that we need to do to make sure that they can grow up to be our neighbors, sit next to us in church, be our coworkers, be our bosses, and if we approach it from that, we are doing we are doing what we need to do, and I'm I'm a firm believer that all that other stuff takes care of itself if you're doing right by kids. Uh, Mr. Buzz Glover, one of our board members, just walked in, and he will attest to the fact that every time we're we're faced with a difficult decision, the board for me frames it through the filter of the question, "What's best for kids?" That's it. 
That is, that is the approach. All the way out to, notice I didn't say down to, but all the way out to the classroom school level. What is best for kids? And it sounds cliche, but it's not. Because that's what the mission and vision says. Whatever it takes for kids to be empowered for success in school and life. So that's what we do. We got a lot going on. Goodness gracious, some of it we planned, and some of it was planned for us. And I guess the biggest, Dean kind of teed up construction, the biggest project we have going on right now, construction related, was not one that I ever planned to do. As a matter of fact, if you had told me before I became superintendent that I would be building Noonan High School, I would have said, you are crazy. I'm not building a high school, and I'm certainly not building Noonan. Right now, we're building Noonan High School back. It's about a $110 million project, uh, doing it in three phases. Um, first phase was all the underground stuff that nobody really cares about. Uh, the second phase is a new gymnasium. It's about $22 million of the $110 million project. And then the, phase, the third phase uh, is the academics field. You can see there's some, some drone footage there. If you look to your, to your top left at about what I would call 11 o'clock, is that thing moving? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give you a little story. <laughs> From time to time, I have vertigo. <laughs> gym's going up. I can tell you that this is this is a couple months old. I think this is from back in December, uh, but the, the gym is now pretty much dried in, so we're at a place where, where the gym will take off, uh, and it'll, it'll speed up and slow down. It's scheduled to be completed next September. Uh, you can see here on your on your right-hand side, that is where the, where the old Newton High School was. Um, that is where the academics, <coughs> academic buildings are going. You can see the beginnings here. Uh, some foundation walls. Oh, um, yeah. You can see the beginning of some foundation walls going in there. Today, you probably have 18 foot high foundation walls around um, probably 75% of what's going to be a storm shelter. Um, we, we have an opportunity through some funding with FEMA uh, to, to make sure that, that we do what's necessary to mitigate future natural disasters. Uh, one thing I learned through this process is currently, if you're in Carroll County and you build a new school, you're required to have a storm shelter in it. Wow. The federal wind field stops at the Carroll Coweta County line. So I like to think that I'm pretty smart from time to time. School gets hit by two tornadoes in six months. Many people don't realize Hurricane Zeta, back in October of 2020, we had an EF zero do roof damage at Noonan High, tore the roof off the AV room. And then March of 2021, we had the EF four come through. So I figured twice in six months, we're putting a storm shelter in. Especially with 12 miles as the crow flies, we'd be required to do it anyway. So there's going to be a storm shelter. It's going to be state of the art. The way I look at um, the rebuilding of Newton High, we are making generational decisions, okay? And we throw that word around a lot in staff meetings and with our board. But we are really trying to design and build a facility that if it will serve the next generations for the next 75 years, the way the old Newton High School served, that we will have done our job. But that's, that's what we're after. Uh, the academic building is scheduled to be complete August of 2024. So the gym will be done next fall. The following fall, August of 24, we'll be moving into uh, the new Newton High. Yeah, that's some more recent stuff. You can see uh, block wall, mason, mason walls going in uh, on the gym facility there. It's going to be a pretty imposing structure, just the lay of the land over there. Uh, we had to build into the to the hill, uh, so it's gonna it's gonna be a beautiful look, but it's going to be imposing. Um, looking at it from that football field, it's gonna be a beautiful beautiful facility. Though. And work is coming along, and we're finally at a point with the gym where weather doesn't get us. Um, we've had just my luck. 
I heard somewhere the other day, it's like the 10th wettest winter of all time in the state of Georgia, and I'm trying to build a school. So um, it's just the way it goes, the way it goes. But it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a great facility, and, and I think that it's gonna be something that everybody can be uh, very proud of. While we're doing that, we're still having school. Um, we're having school on two campuses, uh, Noonan High School campus, and then of course the Cougar Village campus over uh, at the Central Educational Center. So grades 10 through 12 on the Noonan High campus, Cougar Village campus are first time ninth graders. And we're doing all of that uh, while, we, while we try to build uh, a brand new facility. I will tell you, um, the folks at Noonan High have shown themselves to be some kind of resilient. They could have folded the tent and gone to the house a long time ago. They have done an incredible job uh, through a lot of adversity with the tornado. And I'm talking about the staff, the students, everybody. Done a, done a really, really amazing job. Um, Dean mentioned graduation rate. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of where we are at graduation rate. It ticked back above 90%. Um, I will tell you I'm not satisfied with it being at 90.5. I want more. I always want more. I think that's what we should be doing. Um, but, but it did tick back up this year. I'm going to show you in a few minutes. We're going to look at, uh, and actually kind of hot off the press, a demographic and enrollment study that shows some projections for what we look like growth-wise across the system for the next few years. But one of the things that I'm most proud about is typically in high school, your enrollment starts here every year, and it does this throughout the year. Because high schoolers quit. Ours does this. That's a, that's a notice, noticeable change from the last few years. Well, keeping kids in high school translates into uh, graduating them from high school, and then they can go be enrolled, enlisted, or employed. That's what we're at. That is what we're at. Um, Employee pay, I'm all over the place. Y'all can tell, I'm sorry. Employee pay, last year, classified, we, we did a pay raise for all classified employees. It's about $6 million a year investment. Um, increases of up to 25% for some of our classified employees. This year, the governor um, is doing $2,000 raises for certified employees. We're working through the budget process now to see if we're going to do more uh, for our certified employees because here's where we are. Right now in the school system, we have a 93.6% retention rate. That's pretty good. I think the Georgia State average is somewhere around 70% for teacher retention. But we got to remain competitive. If we don't keep up and remain competitive, whether it be classified employees, certified employees, leadership, we're going to lose people. So that's something that, that we're trying to strike a balance right now between we want low property taxes. By the way, that millage rate that the board said back in August is the lowest property tax millage rate in the metro area. And the lowest millage rate that Cal Weed has had since 1983, I think. It's 16. It was at 18.59 for years and years and years. A few years ago, we bumped it down to 17.3, then 17.14, I believe, and now it's at 16 flat. It's the lowest millage rate in the in, in this metro area. Incredible, incredible bang for you both when you look at some of the things that Dean talked about. So we're constantly focused on how we can continue to be very responsible with, with taxpayer money, be very efficient with what we've been entrusted with, and live up to the continued level of expectation that everybody has become accustomed to. Because the community is, is accustomed to us doing our job at a certain level. And we try to do that in a very responsible way. Um, it's through great leadership by our Board of Education uh, to be able to get those rates those rates down. Um, the lowest in, I've said that like four times, I love to say it, it's the lowest in the metro area. Um, you look around and, and we're doing very well. Last week, this is hot off the presses, this is what I, where I wanted to spend the bulk of my time, 
tonight. You, you guys on school councils and our principals in the room, you're really the ambassadors for our school system in the community. And, and a lot of times, a lot of times we think that we need to do certain things, but then we do research and it shows that we may not need to do those things. Um, how we approach enrollment growth or future enrollment growth is this. We daily, weekly, and monthly track enrollment numbers at every school all the way out to the classroom level across the system. So we have projections on where we think enrollment will go by grade level by school, K through 12, pre-K through 12, actually, okay? Every once in a while, I like to bring in an outside group to double check our work. I want to know that what I think I see is what I see. Because just like you, I take Poplar Road home every day. And I see the houses going up everywhere. And I see our internal enrollment projections saying, you're not really going to grow that much. You're going to grow in some pockets. But everything around me says, you're about to blow up. So we bring in an outside group to do an enrollment demographic study for you, or for us. And I want to, want to share some of that with you tonight. Gave the board an overview last week. You're going to get a little bit deeper dive for about 15 minutes tonight. Go, John. Some of, the, some of the sources they use, cities and county governments, the Georgia DOE, Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, U.S. Census Bureau, just to name a few. Keep going, John. We'll run through some of these. Dean mentioned earlier, we have rebounded from uh, the, the pandemic. We're now at our highest enrollment ever, okay? Over 23,000, actually, back in October was when this data was pulled. So 23,200. Elementary has now rebounded to... 2013 numbers, but I want to show you something. It's not at its all-time high. It's not at its all-time high. So elementary is still lower than what it once was. Middle school, close to its all, it's actually at its all-time high or just below it right there. 21 was an all-time high for middle schools. What happens in our business, it'd be great if they came in packs of 30, but they don't, okay? <laughs> They move through the system in bubbles, is what they do. You may have a pack of 15 at one school, a pack of 12 in another school, or three or four, and different grade bands will move through in bubbles. And that's what we're, we're seeing here. Go to high school. Look at those high school numbers. We're keeping them in school. We're graduating. That's what we're at. That's what we're always after. I will always be very satisfied if my high school number is my highest number. Because that tells me that we get them here and we're finishing the job. We're keeping them. It's half the battle is keeping them and not losing them in some way. All right, go ahead, John. Interesting, and this slide is just a lot, okay? It's a lot. There's one I want to show you, though. This group started 2010. This represents kindergarten, 2010. 12 years later, they're our highest cohort. We got them in, we kept them, and now we're getting ready to graduate them in spring with probably the largest graduating class we've ever had. That's what we're after, okay? That's what we're after right there. And we can spend all day trying to figure out the rest of the slide, but the guy that did the presentation told me that's what you want to share with me, okay? <laughs> it's huge stuff. Building permits have bounced back. What was going on right here? Anybody remember? The Great Recession. And now we bounce back building permit wise to an all time high. Here's what I see though when it comes to building permits. Has anybody seen the signs on the road over the past year that they put out like every weekend and they take them back up? Yes. You've seen them. Those things went from a couple years ago, new homes starting in the threes, and then they went to Four, and then they went to, and now I see some sixes and sevens. So permits are at an all-time high, but that does not necessarily mean people with school-aged children. Doesn't necessarily mean that. There's some other factors there um, that we'll look at in just a minute. Go ahead, John. 
in migration to the county, people that moved in 2019 or after, it's still way up, okay? People are still wanting to move here. This is a great place to live, great place to raise a family. Some estimates on future population that they use. The governor's office does a projection all the way to 2050. It shows 217,000 from 100, just approximately 150 at the 2021 census time, okay? Population density, right there. Along 85 and along 34. That's, that's where it is, okay? But you'll see it's, it's starting, to, starting to spread a little bit. But we're projected to grow at a rate of approximately 1.5% per year, 68,000 total new residents by 2050. Okay? Here's some variables that we look at and that outside people look at um, when, when they're coming in to talk about what our enrollment's going to do. Across, and it's hard across 32 schools. It's very difficult to, to accurately project. There's some house bills and laws that dictate where kids can go to school. There are some instances where, where kids may not go to school in an area that they reside in, okay? Um, promotion and retention. Every child that's retained is a child that we didn't anticipate next year being in a grade level or potentially a school. So those are factored in. Workforce supply and demand, growth rate, housing market, um, and then, of course, COVID's one that I think still have a little bit of an impact on our enrollment, okay? All right, go ahead, John. $2.757 billion investment by a company in, that's coming to Coweta, now off the bull and exit, a freighter battery, a $2.75 or $2.57 billion. It's going to bring about 700 jobs, uh, but it will, it will have a generational impact on both our school system uh, and our community. There aren't many, now there have been some recently across the state, but there aren't many 2.75 or 2.57 billion with a B dollar investments that you see. Typically economic, Mark, you've been doing economic development for workforce development for years. How many with a B have you seen here? That's the fifth largest project in the history of the state of Georgia. Fifth largest in the history of the state. So, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. And for us, at Central Educational Center across the system, we have to be thinking about what does that mean for us related to workforce development? Um, because when those companies come here, they're looking to us to make sure that we can turn out people that are employable. Uh, they can be those engineers that they're going to need. So it's huge for us. Go ahead, John. Interesting here, interesting. And I love the title of the slide. The stork stalls. We've seen a bit of a decline in birth rate in Coweta County. This is Coweta County. A bit of a decline in the birth rate. So I think that is something that um, is, is depressing to a degree the amount that we're growing or that we're projected to grow. Okay? Here's building permits by school or by district. Actually, both. East Coweta High, 63% of the building permits issued in the county are on that eastern corridor out there. Okay? East Coweta Middle, 50% of them. And you can see elementary is a little bit more spread out because we have more elementary schools. Okay? But remember, that doesn't necessarily mean more kids. This means more building permits. Go ahead. This is information off of the county's comprehensive plan. And I don't really know what any of that means. <laughs> Go ahead, John. <laughs> Not really don't. <laughs> High school building utilization for us. East Coweta currently at 119% building utilization. Hang on, I help you. Hang on. <laughs> Newton's at 91, Northgate's at 93. Remember, we just redistricted approximately 500 kids from East Coweta to Northgate. That hasn't fully taken effect yet. Also remember, we're building the new Newton High School. 
that will be built bigger than the old footprint, okay? So high school-wise, we have room. Short, short story for you. 2006, I was named assistant principal at East Coweta High School. First day I showed up on the campus at East Coweta High School, we had 17 trailers, portable classrooms on the campus. When I became principal at East Coweta, we renovated. We added 23 instructional units to the campus. We totally, Patrick, we totally changed the way that the campus operated, the way students moved each day. And there are zero trailers on the East Coweta campus. Here's the other thing about these numbers, everybody. Every single block, every single day, we have kids that are off campus going to Central Educational Center. They're in virtual school. They're dual enrolled. Some of them count as enrollees, but they're only there one block. They're homeschooled the rest of the time. Any given block of any day, we are not at 100% at East Coweta High. We're not. We're not. Okay? Those numbers are lower than that. So building capacity is something that, that I pay attention to it, but it's not an end-all, be-all. Okay? We have, we have room with some of the levers that we've already pulled. We have room to grow a little bit in high school in the future. And I think you're going to be surprised at what the what the projections show. Go, go to that. Here's our middle school. Lee's at 116, but I can tell you Lee Middle School, the design of that school, we've had over a thousand kids in it, and today there are seven, 720, and it's at 116%. We had three trailers when we had a thousand, over a thousand kids in it. We got room to grow there, okay? Um, East Coweta, we're watching. It's right on that projection line. East Coweta has one trailer on the campus that is not used for classroom instruction. And if we ever have to expand at East Coweta, we got tons of room. Tons of room, okay? So, so everybody's in good shape. You can see where us building Blake Bass and filling it, we built it when we needed to, and now it's full. Middle school is in pretty good shape, and I'll show you the trend lines in a minute that reflect that. Keep going. Elementary school. Noonan Crossing, remember that population density? Noonan Crossing. Welch is at 88. Elm Street is at 90. I think, Christy, you got a couple of trailers there now, don't you? We're having to watch that one. Moreland. Moreland's growing. 48% at Glam. 48%. So that's something we're watching. Moreland. I think right now we've added four or five trailers out there this year. It's showing that it's going to continue to grow and level off. So we've got to look at how we address the, the moreland Glant corridor through the future, if that, if that holds. Go ahead, John. Historical and projected enrollment, is that, that's 9 through 12. Look at it. Here we are right here, 75-17. It shows us, and these are, I don't trust these things after about four years. Just throw that out there. So 26, 27, it shows us being up in high school less than 100 students. So that tells me we're okay if the trends hold, and we've got, we've got room to maneuver, okay? Especially with continued um, program offerings for kids. Wide variety of things. Well, they're not all going to be on the campus one time. If you had asked me a year ago what I thought this would look like, I would have thought that would have looked like that. And I know many of you probably thought, you know, but it shows us holding steady. It shows us holding steady. Go to the next year. Here's East Calvary High. You can see redistricting is going to take effect over the next couple of years, and that number will drop. It's projected to actually drop some. That's what it's projected to do. Noonan High, I think it's going to grow some. We're going to have plenty of room. Plenty of room once we finish Noonan High for it to grow some. And then Northgate, self-inflicted. Remember, we moved 500 kids to Northgate. But look at what it's projected to do. Pretty steady. Bruce said, I chalked that up too. It's, it's, 
area is older. It's, it's um, older families up there more, and it's just not showing that it's going to grow as much as maybe we would have anticipated. Good news for us is if it does, we got room because we just added on to it. We just added on to it. Here's six through eight. Again, you can see it rise and then level off. And we're going to have some pockets we need to watch in middle school. Go to the next. Arnold, we just did some redistricting with Blake Bass. So Arnold, uh, they were at a peak of over 900 kids. And now you can see they're forecasted to be sevens and even maybe into the sixes. What are you going to do over there with 600 kids, man? Man, goodness gracious. East Calhoun Middle is one we're watching close. It's one we're watching pretty close. Uh, it's it's going to be right at its capacity number over the next few years. We'll see what we do there. And good, the good news is we got a we got a really good physical plant over there. If we need to, if we need to do some addition. Evans, Olmstead, go ahead, John. Lee, great shape. They had I said over a thousand. They were almost at a thousand years ago. So they're in good shape. Go ahead, John. Madras, it was over eleven hundred. We built bass, and now. I think it's, uh, Lorraine's not here. Oh, Lorraine is here. You got it made over there now. <laughs> Goodness gracious. They do a great job over there. But she's 687 last year and beginning to grow a little bit more, I think, because of some of the development on that side of town and because it's a good place to be because of the work they do. Smoky Road. Smoky Road's an interesting one. It lost some population after the tornado. Projected to, to come back a little bit and level off. So that's that's one I'm watching uh, just to kind of see what happens. K through five. Not a lot of movement. I would have thought there'd be more in K through five. And this reinforces what we have seen uh, in our in our internal numbers. Go ahead, John. We'll go through these quick. Arbor Springs, there's room at Arbor Springs. Okay, it's projected to continue to drop just a hair. Uh, down into the 300s. Arco, hold them steady. Atkinson, a little bit of a drop. Brooks is one we're watching. It's a good area. It's a good area. It, it's got room. We have room in Brooks. Um, and if you remember, Arbor shows a little bit below its line. So if we ever had to make some tweaks, we could make some tweaks from Brooks to Arbor if we had to. Candy Gates won. They got one trailer there now. I don't think they're going to use it next year, uh, but, but their forecast to be around that 600, 650, and we see what happens. East side, east side has room to grow. East side's capacity number is actually over 700, I believe, um, and you can see they're projected next year they'll probably be around 93 percent capacity, something like that, 95, and then we'll have to a couple more years. We'll have to go again. Do this again and see what we have. Elm Street, Homestead, Glant. It's one I got to watch. I don't know what the answer is going to be, but we got to we got to look at Glant. Um, you can see the numbers come down over the years, and, and you know you have to look at okay, 200, 245 kids potentially. Do we look to get some other kids possibly to glance at some point? We're not there yet, but remember, I go back to trying to make sure that we're good stewards of what we're entrusted with. And, and if you got one school that has a bunch of kids in it over capacity, do you possibly look down the road and doing something? So that's what we got to keep our eyes on. Jefferson Parkway, hold them steady. Orleans, man. Melanie's ready to put out the no vacancy sign. And I know she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't do it. She thought about it, but she wouldn't do it. But you can see more of them again. Good school. Um, the, the people, people, it's like, like most of our schools, most all of our schools, they love more. People love their school. Um, and, and you can see it's at capacity. She's trying to get me to figure out what to do. So, Noonan Crossing, um, Noonan Crossing at one point had, I think, seven trailers on its campus years ago. Uh, they were up 
over 900, 929. Uh, right now, I think there's a trailer there, but I don't believe they're using it. So we've got some room if we need to use it. Good old north side. Still holding still. Off the roads where both of my daughters have gone to school. Um, was at a 607 high a few years ago and projected to level out. Off the road's an interesting one, though, because all the development headed out that way past Welch. I'm getting to you, Janice. It's interesting to see what happens off the road. Holding steady at Ruth Hill. Holding steady at Thomas Crossroads. And there's Welch. Welch was built to be big. Wasn't it, Janice? Yes. I remind her of that all the time. It was built as a big elementary school. we got to watch it, though, because there's a a good bit of development in that Mary Freeman corridor there to see what happens. That Mary Freeman Poplar Road corridor. We got to continue to watch Welch to see what happens. Um, she's she's doing a good job at using her classroom space. No trailers, no trailers. So watch that. And then Western. All right. Why don't? Willis Road is actually going to go up and then drop a little bit. They, have, they do have three trailers on the campus. I think they're using them. So there we are. You look 10 years out, which I don't, I don't necessarily trust that far out, but you can see um, projected to be 23, 593 uh, in about 10 years. Um, I think we're going to grow across the district over the next five or six years. 500, 600 kids, but they're not going to be in one spot. They're going to come through in those bubbles that I talked about. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to continue to monitor every one of them uh, and see and see whether we need to do a little bit of redistricting in some spots. Um, you may look at if you grow a lot in one certain spot, doing an addition somewhere. Um, so we're in a, we're in a, we're in a good space to, to make some strategic decisions. Here's an interesting one for you, and then I'll let you guys ask any questions of me and get out of here. This is our overall building utilization across the county. Our system total building utilization is 90%. What that, what that tells me is, is we are doing a really good job of maximizing what we've got. We're not wasting space anywhere. High school's at 102. I think we'll see that go back below 100 with the Northgate um, redistricting that we did. You see 94% in middle school, even with the new middle school. And then if I had a choice, if I wanted to be lower in building utilization anywhere, it would be elementary school. It gives us room to maneuver if we need to. So, you know, that, that's a product of not me over the years, previous boards and superintendents they haven't rushed out to go build if we didn't need to build. They haven't made rash decisions. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to take several different data points, compare them against each other, and then make reasonable strategic decisions. That's really, that's really what we're trying to do. For me, when I got this a couple weeks ago, I was, I was relieved because this shows me that I don't need to run out right now and do anything drastic. I need to keep watching. I need to keep paying attention and, and see where it goes. But I think the worst recommendation I could make to the board would be, well, let's go out and build something here, and then we don't have students to put in. So that, that's what, you know, and I, and I hear, when are you going to build that next high school? Not yet. Well, I am building, but not not the one everybody thinks I need to do. Um, so it's it's very interesting um, to see that, that their information directly correlates with our internal information. So um, I hope that gives you a little insight into what we have going on. Any questions for me, so we can get everybody out of here? Yes, ma'am. What percentage of the kids do you still have? We have just over 200 virtual right now, 200. And that really helps us. It, they're, they're counted. They're counted on that overall number, but they're not in classrooms. They're 
They're not in physical classrooms. They're in classrooms, not physical classrooms. Virtual ones, but just over 200. Yes, sir. Dr. Horton, our 90.5 on-time graduation gets compared to other people's 90.5. But we require 28 credits to graduate. We give them 32 opportunities. Other districts require 23 or 24 credits. So why do they compare us as apples and apples? Because they hadn't figured it out yet. <laughs> no, they really do. Um, and we're, I'm not in lowering the standard. We've always had a higher standard for ourselves, I think, than others have for us. Part of the commitment to that block schedule on the high school level and the 28 credit requirement is so that kids can be exposed to a variety of offerings. Guys, when a kid in our system, if they want to, I tell the story all the time, my youngest wants to be a baker. If she wants to be a baker. We got a culinary program here that she can go expose, be exposed to and she can leave high school ready to be the best baker ever. You know, um, our welding program. World renowned. We're going to add diesel mechanic here um, when we do the, the renovation. Uh, AP courses. One of the few systems I know of that still offers driver's education for goodness sakes. So our kids, uh, they're able to get exposure to a lot of things that maybe other other kids and other systems don't. Um, that, it's a big benefit to them. At the end of the day, if we're funneling those decisions through what's best for them, that's the way to go. But yeah, they have to they have to have 28 to graduate. Other systems only have to have 23. As a matter of fact, most systems mark in the state of Georgia is only 23. What other questions anybody have for me? I really want to give you the enrollment information. Y'all can tell I was pretty excited about that. Because um, it, it reinforces for me that we can sit, we can watch for a while, and take a pretty pretty restrained approach to our growth and management. Um, if you don't have any questions for me, I will, I will end with this. Um, you can tell I'm pretty passionate about school system, pretty passionate about what we do every day. I am convicted and convinced that the work that we do every day makes a difference. I'm, I am convinced of that. And I tell principals all the time, if it makes a difference for one family, change by graduating one kid that wouldn't have otherwise graduated, if we, if we change the trajectory of a family, we have the ability to change the trajectory of a community. That is how I approach it. It is how we approach it. We are committed to holding ourselves to an extremely high standard, which has been established uh, for us by those that have come before us uh, and that's what we're going we're going to work very hard to do each and every day uh, i appreciate you coming here tonight um, to, to hear some of the things that we have going on if there is ever anything that, that i can do uh, members of our staff can do to assist you uh, we're a phone call or an email away and i will always call back and i will always respond to the email even when it's not a happy email i will do that because here's the thing, we are dealing with people's kids. Dealing with the two things that are most dear to people, their kids and their money. We should never forget that. So if you need me, call me. Uh, I may not give you the answer you want, but I can promise you uh, that I'll be receptive to what you have to say and I'll be committed to trying to help do what's best for you and your kid. Okay? Thank, Thank you all for coming. And that goes for the school board also. Absolutely.